All right, everyone, you're here for how to play D&D. &D. Uh, so why am I making this video? There's a lot of other kind of tutorials out there where people show you how to play D&D. &D. You can just go read the player's handbook, whatever. Um, but a lot of the tutorials out there aren't kind of an all-in-one package. They'll tell you how to specifically do role play or what saving throws are, and you have to kind of piecemeal pick up these bits of information, and you never really get the whole picture at once. Um, so I want to do a video, this is going to be a long video, um, that kind of tries to give you that whole picture at once that is more of a summary than the player's handbook. Um, and actually adds more information that the player's handbook doesn't go over that just kind of the community decides and things that you pick up when you're reading through the spell lists and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I want to do kind of a summary video that's shorter and a little bit more comprehensive than just reading through the rules uh, and is an all-in-one kind of picture. And I can't really find or recommend any videos out there that are like that. So I want to make one of my own. Um, so... If you're coming from one of my games, if you're watching one of these videos coming from one of my active campaigns, I don't want you to think that you have to watch this video all the way through or that you have to watch it at all. It's sufficient to play in one of my games. You're going to learn how to play as you go. Um, but the focus on uh, the things that I teach you kind of in game and around the sessions are probably going to be on like what kind of individual decisions you should make for your particular character. Um, and how to resolve particular roles, particular spells, stuff like that. Um, it's, it's rare that I'm going to sit down with you and give you kind of like an hour long uh, base foundation because I have like 50 something players, right? Uh, so that's what I want to do here. I want to do that long kind of hour long base foundation that you would get if you were sitting down with a friend learning how to play in college for the first time uh, or something like that, right? Uh, or if you went to a game store and you, you know, made a friend there and they sat you down and they really taught you how to play or your uh, cousin or uncle or whatever kind of got you into D&D. So I want to give kind of that old school full picture guide of how to play Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and we're going off the most recent edition, which is fifth edition, um, uh, all at once. So yeah, a little bit about additions and kind of the history of the game. Uh, so the Dungeons and Dra Dungeons and Dragons is bigger than just a role playing game, uh, but it, the role playing game is the kind of biggest hit that they have. There's video games out there, and Dungeons and Dragons is its own world. It's not just a role playing game. So there's some things in here that you might see that is D and D lore um, that you might be surprised about, like oh, it's not just a fantasy role playing game. Like it has its own world and its own novels and and stuff like that. Uh, so, but the the role playing game is so kind of uh, adaptive. It can be used for so many things that the role playing game kind of has a life of its own and has evolved beyond the Dungeons and Dragons novels and picked up other IPs along the way um, and other stories and other concepts and stuff like that. And it's the most expansive and the most popular RPG out there. So that's probably why you want to learn how to play, to either tell your story um, as a DM or uh, as a player kind of help someone tell their story uh, by playing one of the, the characters in there. Um, so yeah, those are the two roles as well. You either uh, play as the dungeon master, sometimes called the game master for other TTRPGs, um, who kind of controls the environment. I like to think of them as like the computer processor in a video game, kind of. Um, they voice the non-player characters and all that fun stuff, while the players are the main party. So if you think about it like Lord of the Rings, you know, you might be playing Frodo and the GM is going to control orcs chasing you or whatever, or, or the Balrog or whatever have you. Um, and there are bal Balrogs in this game. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of how it works on a basis uh, level. And you're going to be playing a character, and this is your character sheet. So your character sheet kind of tells you uh, what your character can do, um, but it, it, what your character can do is a little bit more broad than what's going on on your character sheet. So your character sheet is kind of giving you inform, uh, kind of inspiration that you can use um, and kind of general guidelines. But you can ask your DM to do anything, and some of the best moments in D&D come from those kind of improv moments that you can't really get in video games. Um, 
So yeah, let's get into it. Let's look a little deeper into the character sheet. So this is a paper character sheet. Um, some of you guys might be using D&D Beyond, especially if you're in my games, um, but, but this is kind of the paper version. I want to use the paper version for kind of most of this because uh, you can do whatever you want on D&D Beyond and some people get into D&D Beyond and think, oh, if I can do it, it must be within the rules. And that's entirely false. Uh, you can write whatever you want on your character sheet. It's just like a paper character sheet. Um, so you, you shouldn't really be... Uh, you know, doing whatever you want on your character sheet, you should be following the rules uh, as you fill things out. Um, so just because you can add a feat um, doesn't mean you you should under the under the rules, right? Um, so let's let's talk a little bit more about uh, kind of what you're actually going to be doing in game. Um, and then you can get an idea of how you want to build your character out and what kind of person you want to play. Uh, I would actually start when you're thinking about playing a character with what kind of person you want to play, what kind of person they should be, um, and what kind of personality traits you're kind of looking for. Uh, so I, I start personally when I'm building a character with a kind of concept of who they are as a person and then build out the statistical aspect of the character from there. Some people start the other direction. They really like a certain subclass or uh, they really like a certain subrace and they'll build uh, other things in that just kind of fit with that. Um, some of the classes and races and backgrounds kind of rhyme with each other uh, and then they'll you know use something in that subclass because you know classes have really good kind of um, narrative inspiration that comes with them and then they'll fill out the character from there that's actually one of the strong suits about D, &D compared to pathfinder where you're choosing all these one by one feats uh, or anything like that in D, D, you're choosing a kind of class and subclass that's already pre-built out for you so it gives you this fantastical character archetype that's already built out and you don't have to do any of that work kind of building that character concept you already have it done um, some people don't like that. The people that really like to get into the nitty gritty and kind of see the gears working and stuff like that don't really like that. But I do. Um, I want to get right into the fantasy and I want to, you know, uh, have a, a strongly narrative character um, kind of from the get go. And d, &D 5th edition is really good at just giving that to you. Um, just kind of giving you what you want, right? So let's look at a completed character sheet really quick and actually talk about how to play. So D&D is a D20 based game. So all, all of, most of your rolls are going to be a 20 sided dice. That's an icosahedron right here. Um, the little triangle sides uh, of, of three dice that have triangle sides. Uh, but yeah, so a 20 sided die is what you're going to roll for most of the rolls in the game. Um, anytime you do something that's kind of... Uh, in uh, that's kind of questionable whether or not it would succeed. Sometimes the DM is just going to roll with it, um, and that's kind of uh, how improv works. Like someone says something, and you're just kind of supposed to roll with it. But anytime there's a question as to whether your character could could, could succeed at this, you're going to roll a twenty sided die. Um, they look a little something like this, uh, and you can see that the top side comes out, and that's going to be an eight for that. Um, and there's three different types of main roles in D&D 5th edition, um, and, and they're all D20s. So you roll a D20 and you add whatever modifier shows up on your character sheet. Um, the most common uh, kind of roles are your attack roles. If you're using D&D Beyond, they're going to be here on your character sheet under actions, um, and then some attacks are going to be in your spell sheet. Um, looks like Spiritual Weapon has an attack there. Uh, so yeah, that's how attacks work. Uh, on Dina Beyond, you can just click the button and it will roll the d20 for you and add your modifier automatically. So we got an 18 plus the eight from here is 26. Um, so you would call that out. And anytime you do attack rolls, you can pair that to an armor class. You have to meet or exceed the armor class to hit. And then once you hit, you roll damage. Um, on your paper character sheet, your attacks are right over here. You have to write them in. So if you have a Warhammer in your inventory or weapons in your inventory, you'll write them in here. We'll talk about calculating your attack bonus and your damage later. Um, but right now, just know whenever you attack, you roll a d20 and add the attack bonus. All right, uh, let's talk about the other main roles. So the other main roles are saving throws and skill checks. 
Your saving throws are here on your D and Beyond character sheet, and they're here on your paper character sheet. Um, there's a saving throw for each of the six skills, um, or abilities, I should call them. Uh, so we have Strength, Dexterity, Constitution, Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma. And then we have the same saving throws. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit, well, let's talk a little bit more about the ability scores. So you have Strength, Dexterity, and Constitution are your uh, physical ability scores. And then you have Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma, which are your mental ability scores. Technically, your brain is a physical object, but that's just how I like to think about them. Um, your strength is your outwardly body strength, like how, much, how many muscles you have in your arms and your legs and stuff like that. Uh, by contrast, Constitution is kind of your internal uh, hardiness. So Constitution is uh, how many hit, it, it determines how many hit points you have. Uh, it's a really good saving throw against poison and disease and stuff like that. While Strength saving throws are more like uh, standing your ground. And Strength also goes to your uh, physical melee attack rolls. Dexterity is the last ability score, and it's kind of how uh, fast and reactive and live you are. Um, so your dexterity saving throw is about dodging out of way of danger. You can also use your dexterity for ranged attack rolls with things like bows, crossbows, um, as well as light weapons like daggers and short swords. Your, in, uh, your mental ability scores are uh, more about like spell casting and stuff like that. Um, so we have Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma. Charisma is the most straightforward. It measures your force of personality and how kind of uh, outspoken you can be. So your Charisma is all of the talking, um, and each ability score in the mental ones are also spellcasting modifiers. So if you're playing a spellcaster, all of your spells will scale off of your Intelligence, Wisdom, or Charisma, depending on what kind of spellcaster you are. Um, charisma saving throws are a little weird, um, and they're not too common, but uh, they're used for not getting banished and kind of like not being sad. Uh, so if someone casts Bane on you or, uh, or tries to banish you, those are charisma saving throws. Again, they're very rare, um, but they do measure kind of your force of personality. Um, so, you know, banishing you from this plane of existence would be your personality kind of holding on. Um, and then the Bane spell is one of those weird ones that else, that's also a charisma saving throw. The most common, uh, well, in, we'll go over intelligence next. The most common uh, mental ability score is wisdom, or, or me mental uh, saving throw is wisdom. Uh, intelligence is the next most straightforward. Uh, so intelligence is how kind of mentally cunning you are. Um... So this measures your ability to recall information, um, as well as kind of figure things out on the spot. Um, and so intelligence is pretty kind of straightforward. It's what it sounds like. It's intelligence. And then wisdom is the weird one. You know, what is wisdom? Uh, but it's uh, in D&D, &D, it's kind of your attunement to the world around you and how much you notice things. So wisdom's used for a lot of natural spell casting, and it's the most common uh, mental saving throw. Uh, wisdom is for stuff like if you're trying to be mind controlled, that might be a wisdom saving throw. And it has a lot of good skills for noticing stuff. Um, intelligence saving throws are more for like uh, actually hurting your mind. Uh, so anything that like does psychic damage is might be an intelligence saving throw. It kind of skews towards that. While anything that does that uh, kind of mind controls you or holds you in place might be a wisdom saving throw. Um, or, or makes you go somewhere, that might be a wisdom saving throw. Um, it's unclear exactly what the division between intelligence and wisdom saving throws are. Um, and if you look in the actual player's handbook, uh, under the saving throws uh, area in chapter 7, it doesn't actually tell you very much what saving throws are, are what. Um, it doesn't really tell you like, hey, this is what dexterity saving throws are or anything like that. This is just something that you pick up by playing the game and by running the game. Um, it, to give you a better idea of what the uh, mental ability scores do, I like to think of intelligence as mental dexterity. I like to think of wisdom as mental constitution. And I like to think of charisma as mental strength. Um, so that's kind of the lines that I draw. They're a little bit different. They're a little bit of a stretch, but that's the, the main idea. 
Um, so yeah, those are the ability scores, kind of what they measure in the, the broadest of senses, and what the saving throws do. Um, so standing your ground physically, uh, dodging out of way of things, avoiding poison and disease, uh, kind of having your mind save itself from psychic effects, uh, mind control and uh, kind of mind paralysis, and then like banishments and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, those are saving throws. Uh, next up are going to be skill checks. So there's a whole big column with a lot of skill checks on your character sheet right here. Um, all of the skill checks have an ability score uh, kind of right next to them outlined. On d, &D Beyond, you will see this on under the kind of mod column. Uh, so how uh, so uh, each ability check is uh, based off of an ability score, and then it has proficiency. So this proficiency column will be uh, filled in if you have proficient, if you have proficiency, and it will be empty if you're not proficient. Uh, on your physical character sheet, you can just tick them off whenever you get proficiency. Uh, so yeah, the each ab uh, ability score is kind of uh, up to the DM what happens there, but but there's general. Uh, kind of ideas of what they do. So let's talk about them. Um, athletics is probably the most simple. It's all it's pretty much all the strength stuff out of combat. And, and ability scores are the most kind of um, wide reaching of the main three roles. Because attack rolls are just for attacking, that's pretty straightforward. Saving throws are like reactionary stuff when something happens and your character's trying to save themselves. And then the skill checks is basically everything else. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, the... Uh, athletics check are basically for anything that you want to do with your strength that's not an attack or saving throw. So you might want to push someone over or grapple someone with an athletics checks, athletic check, um, or it might be, want to be something outside of combat. So if you want to pull open a door that's budged or pull a heavy lever or push a cart up a hill, that might be an athletics check. The dexterity checks are all the kind of dexterous stuff that you want to do as well. Acrobatics is similar to athletics, but it's typically like staying on your feet on a tricky situation, you know, walking over ice or something like that. Uh, and you can see the examples on Dina Beyond when you pull that up as well. Um, acrobatics can also be used to kind of uh, go against an enemy athletics check sometimes. Sleight of hand and stealth are pretty self-explanatory. Stealth is to move quietly, um, and sleight of hand is manual trickery and stealing stuff and stuff like that. Um, and then we get to the uh, mental skill checks, which are a lot more plentiful, you can see. There's no constitution checks. Um, uh, most constitution stuff is saving throws. Uh, so yeah, we have intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. Charisma are the most straightforward ones. You have de deception, intimidation, performance, and persuasion. These are just the talky skills, right? So if you want to deceive or intimidate or persuade someone um, or put on some kind of performance, um, those are all charisma checks. Uh, performance sometimes is like uh, pre pretending to be someone else as well. Uh, for intelligence and wisdom, this is where things get a little tricky. Again, it's this kind of toss-up uh, or, or miscommunication that people have between intelligence and wisdom. Um, I like to think of wisdom, again, as noticing stuff, and intelligence as like knowing or figuring stuff out. So for uh, wisdom, the kind of general noticing stuff check is perception. And then all the other skills are noticing stuff about something specific. Survival is noticing stuff about the natural world, following tracks, hunting game, um, guiding your party, stuff like that. So just noticing stuff and being attuned to your surroundings in the natural world. Medicine is noticing stuff about illnesses and injuries. Insight is noticing stuff about other people, their body language, if they're lying, trying to predict someone's next move, stuff like that. Animal handling is noticing stuff about animals rather than people. Um, so it's kind of like an insight check for animals. Um, it works well with uh, if you have a mount, uh, keeping that mount in line. Uh, if you have a pet, determining what they're trying to tell you, stuff like that. Intelligence is, again, the kind of memory recall and if you know something or if you can figure something out. So the general if you, uh, intelligence check is probably investigation. So this is just like, hey, can I figure something out? Um, and then you have Arcana for magic stuff. So this is how much you know about magic. History is kind of for uh, 
the, you know, the history of the world and lore and stuff like that. Nature is again the one for the natural cycle. Um, you might be, uh, you know, recalling if a certain plant has certain uh, abilities or anything like that. And then religion is uh, the same thing, figuring stuff out or recalling lore about uh, deities and the divine and stuff like that. So those are your ability scores. Um, so yeah, those are the three roles. Um, those are saving checks, uh, saving throws, uh, skill checks, and attack rolls. You basically already know how to play D&D now. If someone handed you a character sheet, um, you would know what to do. You would, uh, you know, roll a saving throw when the DM tells you that you can roll one. Uh, roll a skill check uh, when the DM tells you, or you might say, hey, I want to, can I make an investigation check about this thing? Or can I make a nature check about this flower that we see on a windowsill that's looking kind of weird? Uh, can I make an attack roll because I want to attack something? So you basically kind of already know how to play D&D. Um, the other main role that you'll come across is initiative. Um, so your initiative score is right up there and right up here on your par car uh, paper character sheet. Um, this is just a dexterity check. Some stuff applies to only initiative checks. It's, it's kind of like a skill of its own, but it's used pretty often, so it's outside the skill box. Um, again, just roll a d20, add your uh, dexterity modifier. Some other stuff uh, adds to it as well. And initiative is just for tracking time more specifically. Um, once you get in initiative, uh, you take turns from highest initiative to lowest and then back around to the top, with each round uh, equaling six seconds. Um, so everyone's actions are kind of happening semi-simultaneously in the same six second span. There might be, you know, one second between the start of one person's turn and the start of the next turn, um, but the turns overlap each other quite a bit, uh, kind of in real time. Um, so yeah, that's how turns work. And turns are back to back. Nothing happens between one of your turns and the next turn. Um, everything that's happening kind of in combat is happening uh, mostly at the same time. Um, so yeah, that's how uh, initiative works. Not all initiative scores are for combat. Some initiative scores are rolled for traps um, or for chases or anything like that. But most initiative scores are indeed combat. So yeah, those are the three main roles. You now know how to play D&D if you're handed a character sheet. Um, you just roll all the numbers that are filled out for you. Uh, saving throws, DMs will tell you. Skill checks, you can sometimes uh, say. Sometimes the DM tells you. If you're just describing what you want to do, the DM will kind of classify it as a skill check. Uh, and then your actions are over. Your attacks are over here. You basically know how to play. Uh, but as you might have uh, could tell, it gets a little bit deeper than that. There's spells. There's inventory. Uh, there's all these features you have to manage and stuff like that. Uh, but all that stuff comes from your three main things that determine your character during character creation. Your class, your background, and your race. Um, your class has a level, and you can level all the way up from 1 to 20. Your backgrounds and races do not have levels, but sometimes your race uh, changes based on character level. But we'll talk about that a little bit. So let's talk about choosing these uh, classes, races, and backgrounds. So each, uh, so we have races over here, we have backgrounds over here, and then let's get some classes pulled up as well. Uh, so D and Beyond compiles the classes really nicely. Um, if you're playing kind of in person or from the rule books, you'll have to look at the specific sources to find all of these things. Most of these come from the player's handbook, and if it's your first time playing D&D, there is no shame in sticking to the good old PHB. That rhymed. Um, if you're, uh, but if you're a little bit uh, more experienced, a lot of these options come from Xanathar's Guide to Everything and Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, which have a lot of uh, subclasses and even a full class uh, for players to choose from. Monsters of the Multiverse is mostly monsters for your DM, but it also has a bunch of, a bunch of races for players to choose as well. Um, and Fizbin's Treasury of Dragons is kind of the same thing, mostly... Uh, Mostly stuff for DMs, but a little bit of uh, kind of choices for players as well. These rule books, the Player's Handbook, Xanathar's Guide to Everything, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, Morning Canaan Presents Monsters of the Multiverse, and Fizbin's Treasury of Dragons make up the core rule books of D&D. 
uh, along with the Dungeon Master's Guide and the Monster Manual. But there's no player options in there. Or few. They're not necessarily meant for players. Uh, so these make up the core rule books for D&D. Almost every DM allows everything from these books. Um, these are the published hardcovers in 5th edition that are not setting specific and not part of a specific adventure. So the adventure books are over here that kind of uh, tell an adventure to run your players through. Um, and there's also setting guides. So Eberron Rising from the Last War is all about the setting of Eberron. Uh, Eberron. It has uh, player options, but they're for Eberron. Um, Sword Coast Adventures Guide has player options, but they're for the Sword Coast. So they're not for everything, right? The core rule books are for everything. They're kind of setting agnostic um, and not part of a specific adventure. So your, your DM will probably allow everything from these rule books. So that's what we're gonna go over today. Um, so let's talk about the races, classes, and backgrounds. You can choose these in whatever order you want. Um, and different DMs and different sources will tell you to choose them in different orders. Uh, I, in particular, like to choose my class first. Uh, d, d Beyond has you choose your race first, I believe. Um, and then your class and then your background. I actually like to go class and then race and then background. Because, and, and I think this order will change when one D&D comes out, but for now, your class is your most impactful choice. This is your biggest choice that you'll make. Um, and then your race is kind of your second most impactful choice, and then your background is kind of your third most impactful choice. Some backgrounds have feats. I would stay away from those, unless your DM tells you that those are okay. Because those give you a leg up on other players that are just sticking to the player's handbook, for example. But for now, let's just choose a class. So I'm going to go over the classes and not really choose one in particular. I'm going to leave it to you to choose the classes. So most of the classes are kind of on the same. Uh, some people think certain classes are harder to play, quote unquote, or easier to play, quote unquote, or better for beginners. Um, I don't know about any of that. Uh, you know, D&D is a complicated game, uh, however you slice it. Um, but it's typically kind of agreed upon by the uh, community that martial classes tend to be easier to play and have less complicated subclasses, while spellcasting is a little bit more homework. Um, I also want to mention that most of these classes came out uh, or, or were first kind of developed um, before the 21st century. Um, Warlock uh, came out in, in the year 2000. I think it was flat year 2000. Uh, and Artificer came out in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, which was super recent. I think that was like 2021. Uh, so Warlock and Artificer are the most recent, and I believe they're also the most complicated. Uh, and we'll talk about these classes in a bit, but they're complicated for their own reasons and they have a lot of kind of picking and choosing individual things. They don't come with this full kind of package that you can just kind of sit down and play your, your fantasy. Uh, so let's talk about the classes. So Barbarian first and foremost. Uh, Barbarian's main class feature is their Rage. Um, their hit dice is a d12, which is the biggest hit die. Um, hit die basically tell you how fast you can... Uh, kind of passive or naturally regenerate your health without any spell casting or anything. Um, and they also tell you how much your max health is. So barbarians have the highest health and they have rage, which means they can take less damage. Um, uh, they have advantage on strength checks and strength saving throws um, and all that fun stuff. Uh, you can see that their primary ability is strength and their saves are strength and constitution. So barbarians are all about this kind of raw physical strength. Um, I should also mention advantage, because we're going to get into advantage quite a bit. Advantage is one of the main things in, in D&D 5th edition. Um, what it basically means is you roll 2d20s, uh, and then you take the higher of the two. So we rolled it as 8 and a 13, we'll take the 13. So let's say we're doing a strength saving throw with advantage. Um, we would take 13, add plus 8, and the result of this roll would be 21. Uh, the other die has nothing to do with that. It just happens to be eight. So let's let's do another example. Let's say we're doing disadvantage, which is where we take uh, roll two dice and take the lower of the two. Ah, uh, we missed out on a crit twenty. So we're gonna get we're gonna take the ten. Say this is still a strength check with disadvantage. So plus eight is gonna be eighteen. Is the result of that roll. So advantage means you roll twice and take the higher. Disadvantage means you roll twice and take the lower of the two. 
Um, I should also talk a little bit about crit 20s before we get too deep in the class uh, struggle. Um, when you roll a 20 on a uh, attack roll, uh, a straight up 20 with, uh, you know, on the actual die itself, uh, hey, look, we got a 20 right there. Um, you get to roll one more die of the uh, of the damage. Well, you get to double the damage dice. So the damage die for uh, a javelin happens to be 1d6. We're going to double that up to 2d6. And D&D Beyond will actually do this automatically for you. So our crit is going to be 14 damage. It's called a, crit tw uh, a critical 20 because it uh, happens um, kind of all on its own. Uh, when the normal kind of average for this damage would be around 8. Um, yeah, we got around 9. Uh, so 14 is a whole lot of damage, and it's exciting when crits happen. Um, you can also crit with spells that sometimes have more damage dice. Um, so if I critted with, say, Firebolt uh, at 7th character level, that would be 2d10. If I rolled the crit, I would get uh, to roll 4d10. So I'm double doubling the damage dice. Um, crits have a lot of house rules, so so ask your DM uh, what they think of crits before you start playing. Um, a lot of DMs will honor a crit 20 as a success, even on skill checks and saving throws, even if your modifier would have said it's not a success. So say the DC for um, a intelligence saving throw is 23, because I'm up against Halister or some crazy spellcaster. Um, if I roll an intelligence saving throw, or say it's 24, if I roll an in intelligence saving throw and I roll a crit 20, uh, that's going to be a 23 total, but since it was a crit 20, the DM might just say, you succeed. Um, so yeah, ask your DM about how they feel about crits. Um, and that's something that I should mention as well with DCs. Your saving throws and skill checks are uh, checked against di difficulty classes, sometimes called DCs. Just how your attack rolls are checked against ACs, sometimes called armor classes. Um, you have to meet or exceed an AC or DC to succeed. Um, so if you're up against a 19 armor class, you have to roll a 19 or higher to hit, not a 20 or higher. But yeah, back to the classes. So you have the Barbarians, their main class features, their Rage, they're all about strength. You have a Bard, whose uh, main class feature is Bardic Inspiration. They're all about performance, and uh, these are full casters. So Barbarians are full martial classes. They're all about using weapons. Bards are full magic classes. So they're all about magic. You can tell as a class is a full caster. People, you know, vary on the definitions, and there's no definition within the rule like this. This is something that the community has kind of come up with. Um, you can tell a class is a full caster, in my opinion, if they get access to ninth level spells. Let me check and see if I'm recording. I'm still recording. Um, so that's how you can tell if something's a full caster. Uh, so bards are all uh, are mostly about their music. Um, but they have a d8 hit dice, um, so they have a little bit of health, they have a little bit of uh, proficiency with weapons and armors and stuff like that, um, but they're mostly about their spells and performance and stuff like that. So their primary ability is Charisma. Um, charisma is actually their spell casting ability, so all of their spells flow with their Charisma. Um, so it determines their, you know, the strength of their performance actually t determines the strength of their spells. Not every bard is about playing instruments. Some are about singing, some are about dancing, or using artistry with sword dancing, and, and all that stuff is kind of in your subclass. So once you choose your class, you're also gonna choose a subclass that's a specification even further that has those nicely packaged uh, fantasy archetypes. You're, you'll typically get your subclass anywhere between levels one through three. Um, for Bard and Barbarian, you're going to get your subclass at, I believe it's level 3 for Bard. Um, it's definitely level 3 for Barbarian. Yeah, Bard College, right there. Uh, each class has a different name for their subclass, so like Barbarians, I believe, is a path. Bards are colleges, um, and clerics are domains. Clerics are another full caster. Um, they're all about religious magic. Uh, so their magic comes from uh, their connection to a deity or a god or something like that. Um, they have another d8 hit dice, so they're decently hardy, um, and their spellcasting modifier is wisdom. 
So their magic gets more powerful as they become more attuned to their surroundings. Since the gods are a present forces in the physical world in D&D, &D, um, a cleric might get more powerful magic from his god if uh, he is more attuned to that god's presence. Um, so that's why wisdom is kind of their ability. Similar things with druids. Druids are also full casters. Um, they get the access to the highest level spells. Um, oh, oh, Cleric's main uh, class ability is Channel Divinity, where they can raise their holy symbol and call out to their gods for special effects. Uh, druids are kind of like clerics, but with natural magic. Um, druids' uh, magic comes from nature itself. Uh, it's kind of like divine magic. They can do a little bit of healing. Bards can do a little bit of healing too, but clerics are the main healers. If you want to go a healing uh, class uh, and you're just using player's handbook stuff, uh, cleric is your best bet. Uh, druids can do a little bit of natural healing and plant growth and speaking with animals and stuff like that, um, but they're all about the spells. Um, the main class features of druids is actually something called wild shape, where they can turn into different animals. Fighters are another full marshal, kind of like barbarians, but where barbarians uh, kind of rely on f uh, physical uh, pure strength, uh, fighters are more about technique. Um, and skill and training and stuff like that. So they have a little bit lower hit dice, a D12, a D10, still pretty good. Um, and they can use dexterity as well. So fighters can use kind of lighter weapons and you're gonna be more happy with kind of the abilities that they get and stuff like that. Um, and each class also gets proficiency in two saving throws. Uh, fighters get strength and constitution, for example. Now, each class's saving throw is one of the three main saving throws. Uh, so the three most popular saving throws are Dexterity, Constitution, and Wisdom. These used to be called Reflex uh, Fortitude, and uh, I'm forgetting what Wisdom used to be called. But there used to be three saving throws that were disconnected from the uh, ability checks, and they just kind of got better with level and class. Um, but now each class just gets proficiency with two. So you get one of the main ability scores and one that's just fitting for the class. So strength and constitution makes sense for barbarian and fighter. Um, druids get intelligence and wisdom. Wisdom is their spellcasting modifier. That makes sense. Intelligence kind of makes sense for kind of a witch of the woods. Uh, cleric kind of makes sense. Um, bard makes sense as well. Uh, Charisma is their main spellcasting modifier. And then dexterity because they're kind of dodgy. Some of them use swords, stuff like that. Um, the fighter's main... Uh, main thing that they use in their class, uh, their kind of call sign, is Action Surge. Uh, they also get more extra attacks, uh, and they also have a fighting style. Other classes have fighting styles, um, but no one else uh, has Action Surge. Fighters can, and, and other classes get extra attack, but no one else has Action Surge. So with Action Surge, you can take an extra action in combat. So you can do a bunch of slashes and stuff like that uh, if you're playing a fighter, and they have the most extra attacks uh, of anyone. So you can take the most attacks on your turn if you're playing a fly fighter and getting up into the higher levels like uh, level 11. Monks are kind of similar to fighters, um, but with a little bit of a lower hit dice and more about spirituality. Um, so where barbarians and fighters use kind of physical weapons, monks use a lot of lighter weapons like nunchucks and uh, short swords and darts and unarmed strikes, just kind of punching and kicking and stuff like that. Um, and they also have, uh, have a lot of meditation, um, and their main class ability is called Key. So Key is a pool of points equal to your monk level, where you can do some martial arts with it, you can do some spiritual stuff with it, you can try to stun your enemies, you can heal yourself, all that fun stuff. And then you get some uh, strength and dexterity saving throws, uh, and you're going to be mostly using your dexterity and wisdom scores. Paladins are kind of similar to fighters and very similar to rangers. So these are the two half casters. Artificers are kind of half casters, but we'll get to we'll get to you later, Artificer. You know what you did. Uh, so rangers and paladins are half casters. They get up to fifth level spell slots, so not the highest level of spells, and they typically have less spell slots, but they also have a lot of fighting abilities too. So they have extra attacks and a lot of martial abilities. Um, paladins are more about like melee combat, rangers are more about ranged combat, um, but it goes a little bit deeper than that. 
uh, paladin's magic comes from an oath that they swore. It could be to themselves, it could be to a king, it could be uh, to anything, really. Um, and your oath is your subclass. Uh, your spellcasting ability is going to be charisma, um, and most of your attacks are going to be based on strength. Uh, because you're going to do a lot of melee attacks, you're going to be using heavy armor that you might need some strength scores for, stuff like that. So you're this kind of holy uh, champion. Um, rangers, by contrast, are kind of like the... So, so paladins are kind of like a cleric half-caster. Um, kind of taking half of the stuff from clerics and maybe some stuff from the fighter. Rangers are like that, but for druids and fighters. Um, so they're half casters again, they get 5th level spell slots, they get some martial abilities, they have some armor proficiencies, uh, but not as much as paladins, and all the weapon proficiencies as well. Your primary abilities you're going to be using is dexterity, because you're going to be using some ranged weapons, some light weapons, stuff like that, and your spell casting modifier is wisdom. So all of your scales, spells are going to st uh, scale by your wisdom. Um... So yeah, that's how kind of paladins and rangers work. Um, rangers are also really good at kind of navigating the environment and stuff like that. Um, it's debatable what their favor, uh, what their kind of main class ability is, um, because they have favored enemy and favored terrain and stuff like that. But those abilities kind of got rewritten later. Um, uh, so just know that you're you're built for kind of roving, roving the uh, the the nature around you and stuff like that. Paladin's main ability, I'm gonna say, is their smites. Uh, so you have a, a, a sacred, uh, you have a divine smite, and you have a bunch of other sacred smites that you can get on your spell list. You can use spell slots to fuel these smites, and then uh, you know bring down your weapons, glowing in holy fire or otherworldly light um, or anything like that. You can even get psychic smites. Um, so yeah, those are the half casters. Next up, let's talk about rogues. Rogues are the last of the full marshals, um, combined with barbarians and fighters. Monks are weird. Um, I'm not going to classify them as full marshal, but they're pretty close. Um, rogues are the last of the full marshals. And while the other martial classes are all about kind of uh, using... Uh, typically have high strength scores rogues typically have high dexterity scores and they rely on dexterity for a lot they rely on dexterity for their main armor class and dodging out of way of effects they rely on dexterity for their initiative scores which are sometimes important to get the drop on enemies and then they also rely on their dexterity scores for those light weapons like throwing daggers which is a really good idea if you're a rogue um, using crossbows like hand crossbows and concealed weapons and stuff like that and rogues are all about their trickery and their stealthiness and their lock picking uh, and stuff like that so your main ability score is going to be dexterity and that needs to be pretty high because that's the main thing that you're going to be relying on um rogues use some light armor but and don't have a whole lot of weapon proficiencies but you won't really need them because all you need is some good daggers uh and and maybe a short sword or two the rogues main ability uh Mm, uh, well, they get expertise, so they're really good in some skill checks, but their main kind of class ability is probably sneak attack. Um, sneak attack is when you hit with an attack once per turn, um, you can deal extra damage on the attack if some things are true. So if you get advantage, you always get that sneak attack. If you're attacking someone next to an ally, you always get that sneak attack. And then your subclasses give you more uh, opportunities to sneak attack and stuff like that. But, but you're always trying to kind of get the drop on enemies with your, with your sneakiness. And then we got the Sorcerer, Warlocks, and Wizards. Uh, this trio is all about full casting. And these are the most full caster casters of the full casters. Um, so they're kind of all about their spells. Um, warlocks are a little weird. Some people don't say they're full casters, but they definitely are, um, in my opinion. Uh, so let's talk about them. Um, they all have pretty low hit dice. The Wizard and Sorcerers have D6s. And then the Warlocks have a D8 because they can do a little bit of fighting. Um, sorcerers uh, draw their magic from something inherent. It might be their bloodline, it might be a magical gift, as the description says, um, or it might be something about th uh, them kind of in particular. Um, so you might have a little bit of dragon blood in your past, uh, you might just get your magic from the fact that magic is weird, uh, so that's kind of what sorcerers are about. Um, your ability, your spellcasting ability is going to be charisma. Um, charisma is, 
your kind of force of personality. So your inherent magic is kind of based on just how uh, forceful your 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 presence really is. Um, so those that's what sorcerers are all about. Um, kind of this magic that just happens. Um, your primary ability in your class is meta magic. So you get to do magic on top of your magic. You can twin your spells, you can speed up your spells, all that fun stuff. Uh, the You can also use this to get more spell slots. And what this kind of does is make sorcerers one of the best blasters. If you just want to send magic flailing across the battlefield wherever you want, sorcerer is the class to do it. Let's talk about Warlocks and Wizards. We're going to save Warlock for last, right before Artificer, because things are going to get kind of weird. Uh, but let's talk about Wizards. Wizards are all about kind of the written word. Wizards use the same kind of spell casting as anyone can learn. So Wizards went through uh, the hardship of learning their spells and documenting them in a spell book. Rogues and fighters um, can actually learn some wizard spells. Everyone can learn wizard spells. Anyone can become a wizard. Um, all you need to do is put in the time and learn the arcane formulas and stuff like that. So your primary spellcasting ability is going to be intelligence because you learn the spells. You have to recall what they do. You have to recall the right components to do them. Um, and it, you're kind of like putting together these formulas, uh, kind of like a chemist or, or a physicist or something like that. Except physics is magic in this world. Um, and you're going to be, you know, uh, casting less spells than the sorcerer, but your spells are going to have uh, more concentration um, and uh, you're going to have less cantrips than the sorcerer too, um, but it's kind of about how you use the spells with wizard. Um, and you're going to get a lot of really cool uh, uh, abilities in your school, depending on what school of magic you choose. Um, and then let's talk about uh, warlocks. Uh, sorcerers and wizards, by the way, get very few uh, weapon proficiencies and, and no armor proficiencies. Warlocks get like light armor, I think, and maybe some weapon proficiencies, but they're mostly about their spells, unless you choose Hexblade, but we're not going to talk about Hexblade right now. Um, warlocks get their power from their, uh, oh, oh, not from an oath. I almost said oath, like paladins. Warlocks get their... Um, get their magic from a pact. So a pact is some kind of bargain or, or, or deal that you made with something. It's not a god. It might be kind of like a demigod, but it's just some kind of extra planar entity. So you have a lot of Lovecraft information and weird and, and kind of weird stories, inspiration in here. Um, but some warlocks make pact with cool things, uh, like uh, celestials, or kirin, or unicorns. So you can be a nice warlock. You can also be a nice warlock, even if you made a pact with a fiend or a devil. You might have done so because of, uh, you know, bad situations in your life, which is how most warlocks come to be. Your spellcasting ability is charisma, mostly because players like that. Um, uh, some people just, you know, say, hey, it's your justification, uh... Your justification is that it's your connection of your personality to your uh, patron is what the thing that you made with a pact is called. Um, I would have liked if there would have been intelligence because it's kind of like diving into these otherworldly secrets. And if you're playing in my games, you can make your warlock, uh, you can make your warlock spellcasting ability intelligence. That's totally fine with me. Um, but it's charisma for now, and also witches uh, always kind of go around and. Uh, you know, uh, sow secrets in people's minds and stuff like that. Um, what's complicated about... So so your main uh, class feature, this is kind of what's complicated about Warlocks. Um, so you get your otherworldly patron. This is your subclass at first level. And at second level, you get something called Eldritch Invocations. And at third level, you get your Pact Boon. Your Pact Boon is like a, a little kind of piecemeal... Uh, bonus that you get there's only there's only four to choose from there's three in the player's handbook and there's another in tasha's cauldron um you can get like one spell and get some extra stuff with your spell you can get some extra cantrips you can get like a sword you can call to you and stuff like that um but that's not nearly as complicated as eldritch invocations so your eldritch invocations are the main thing that makes warlocks complicated and the main thing that makes them kind of fun and interesting um these are piece by piece, one by one, things that you can choose. 
uh, and you get more Eldritch Invocations as you level up. Um, you know, uh, you're going to get two Eldritch Invocations at second level, you're going to get three at fifth level, and then four at uh, seventh, and it goes up all the way up to eight Eldritch Invocations uh, in the very late game. Uh, so, each Eldritch Invocation is kind of its own thing, and most of this class description, you can see, is going to be your Eldritch Invocations. Um, and there's a lot of Eldritch Invocations to choose from, and you just kind of have to flip through in real life and do your studying, um, and, and see which Eldritch Invocations are good for your particular character. Uh, there's a few common Eldritch Invocations that most people choose. Um, I really like, uh, <coughs> Armor of Shadows. I think that's really cool. It just gives you better AC. Um, but, but each Invocation does something different. Agonizing Blast is also one of the most popular. So, for example, Ascendant Step at 7th, at ninth level, um, <clears throat> you can choose this and then cast Levitate on yourself at will. You don't expend a spell slot, you don't pay anything for it, you just do it whenever you want. And Levitate can bring you up to uh, kind of 20 feet high, and you can just stay in the air. So Ascendance Up is just like you stepping into the air whenever you want. Um, you, you don't need to sleep with be, uh, with Aspect of the Moon, you can get proficiency in skills, um, you can get weird fly stuff going on. Uh, so Warlocks are kind of one of the most complicated classes, and in my opinion, my favorite class. <clears throat> Let's talk about Artificers for a second. So Artificers came out in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and they're very, very complicated. Artificers are kind of half-casters. They, uh, they do have cantrips, though, unlike uh, the Rangers and the Paladins. Uh, but they only get up to 5th level spell slots. Um, their main class, so, so their main class ability is going to be intelligence, they have an average hit dice, um, they have constitution saving throws, which is really good for concentration spells, um, and they can do some fighting, they have some extra attacks and subclasses and stuff like that, um, but your main class ability is going to be your infusions. Uh, infusions are temporary, temporary uh, enchantments that you can put on weapons and armor and items. So you're not making a permanent magic item, but you are infusing it kind of for the day. And you can repeat these every day um, and make a kind of semi-temporary magic item. So you can make a magic sword uh, or so, and then your infused item limit goes up. So at, at second level, you can only have two of these kind of semi-magic items. You can just take a regular item and turn it magical. And then you get three and four and five, all the way up to six magic items um, that you can just kind of make magic. Um, and then you have a bunch more infusions known. So you have twice as many infusions known as your current infused items. So you can kind of use half of them at a time and, and keep those active. Um, so yeah, the artificers are all about like, uh, you know, in fantasy, that dwarf that always is selling magic items or that gnome that's always making trinkets. So you're kind of the engineer or the maker, uh, the smith of the party. There's also the Blood Hunter. Um, this was written by Matthew Mercer and never published by Wizards of the Coast. Uh, it's not official material. I would not choose it. Um, it's up to your DM whether they allow it, but it's kind of uh, just a third party random thing that's in there because of a business deal. Um, so I would stay away from Blood Hunter. Um, that is all the classes. That's a lot to take in. Um, but you should choose one class, and then you can also multi-class later. So when you gain a level, you can put it in an existing class, or you can put it in another class. And most DMs will let you change up your kind of level spread whenever you want. So if you have five levels in Cleric and one level in, uh, let's say, Fighter, um, and your DM might let you, you know, put two levels in Fighter and four levels in Cleric and kind of respect that way. Um, so yeah, that's how classes work. Choose your class. Uh, don't don't be too pressured. Your DM will probably let you change it later, um, and you can always multi-class as well. <clears throat> Let's talk about so your class is kind of what you do as an adventurer. Let's talk about races and backgrounds. Races is kind of what you are physically, and then backgrounds is kind of what you've done before you started adventuring. For races, we're just going to go over what's in the Player's Handbook, what's in Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, and what's in Mordenkainen's Monsters of the Multiverse. Um, those are kind of the main race um, options, as well as Spelljammer. Uh, so these are so uh, 
Morning Kanan's uh, Monsters of the Multiverse and the Player's Handbook are the core options, but a lot of DMs uh, and a lot of players really like the lineages in Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, and I really like the Spelljammer races, so we're going to go over those a little bit. The Spelljammer races are kind of like the sci-fi stuff, so we'll, we'll get to those last. Um, let's talk about the player's handbook first, because these are kind of the core races. Um, you have your dragonborns, which are kind of like your dragon uh, humanoids. You also have your humans, so you can just play a regular human if you want. Um, the humans are kind of the broadest races. You can kind of apply these to whatever. Um, dragonborn are all about kind of clan, and they have a breath weapon. So if you ever want to breathe fire, you can choose a dragonborn. Um, these racial traits, you can see some ability bonuses in those. You can move those around if you want. These are just kind of uh, suggestions. Um, and I can and uh, you can show uh, I can show you how to use move those around in my uh, how to use D and D Beyond for players video. Uh, so yeah, after humans, you have kind of the core fantasy races. You have your dwarves, they're exactly what you expect. Your elves, your gnomes, your half elves, your halflings, your half orcs. Those are exactly what you expect. Your halflings are these lucky diminutive folks. Your gnomes are these tiny uh, kind of machining, tinkering folks. Your elves are these haughty, graceful people. Your dwarves are these stout and sturdy uh, individuals. And your half-orcs are, uh, you know, a cross between the human and the orcish races. <clears throat> You also have your tieflings sitting around here in the player's handbook. Your tieflings are uh, kind of a person with a drop of uh, otherworldly blood, uh, blood from uh, a different plane of existence. Um, typically, this manifests most often as uh, a bit of hellish blood. Um, so you get some infernal stuff, uh, you get like resistance to fire damage, you get some infernal spells, um, stuff like that. And there's a bunch of different kinds of tieflings. So you can actually choose which layer of hell your racial traits come from. Ben Richten's Guide to Ravenloft has some really cool things called lineages. Lineages are not your race. You actually choose your race and then you can choose a lineage if you want. Um, and it replaces some of your racial stuff. Um, so lineages are something that actually happened to you. Uh, the three different lineages are Dampir. That's kind of like a half vampire. Uh, you kind of have a little bit of life, life left, yet you have some kind of weird hunger. So it might be for blood, but it might be for other stuff like psychic energy or, or anything like that. Um, so Dampirs are kind of like half vampires. Hex bloods are hexed in some way. They're infused with eldritch magic or fey energy or some kind of witchcraft. Uh, these are typically created by hags. Um, so you're kind of like a half hag, if that makes sense. So, you know, fey kidnappers swapped you and your parents' child. Uh, your parents made a bargain with a hag, something like that. So you have some kind of haggish, feywild ish um, kind of horrific uh, hex um, that's been set on you and changes you physically. Um, and then you have your reborn, um, which uh, kind of came back from some kind of death. Uh, so you might be something like a ghost, you might be something like a half zombie, um, stuff like that. And these are kind of horror tropes, but players really like them. Um, and you can, and as the saying goes, you can always come back as a reborn. Um, so yeah, those are the lineages. Um, and then Mordenkainen has some uh, more monstrous races. Um, so some of these are thought of as like, you know, main characters. Some of these are thought of as, as monsters in some fantasy worlds. Um, but in D&D, it's kind of skewing towards urban fantasy right now. Um, so a lot of the races that were previously thought of as monsters, like orcs and goblins, are now people. Um, and you can play them and uh, their societies are um, kind of just as thought out and uh, personified as any other um, as any other kind of uh, society of people. So I have the Aarakocra, which are kind of your bird folks. Um, they have flight, they have some talons, and they're from the elemental plane of air. So you have some air stuff in them as well. Um, and then you have Genasi. Um, there's a bunch of different kinds of Genasi. There's fire Genasi, uh, earth Genasi, and water Genasi, if you come down here. Um, all the Genasi are kind of half genies. Um, so you have a bit of ancestry from a genie. In the case of air Genasi, you have some air stuff. Um, I, I don't think you need to breathe at all. You just always have air in your lungs. Uh, you have lightning resistance, and you can kind of do this weird levitation stuff. 
Um, Asimar are kind of like the tieflings, but from the upper planes of existence. So you're infused with a little bit of kind of this heavily player, uh, heavily uh, powers and stuff like that. Um, you have some light. Uh, you have some, you know, healing light that you can put on people. Um, you grow wings for a brief moment in some Asimar, uh, stuff like that. Uh, so uh, you let's talk about the deep races as well. So you have your races of the Underdark, like the Deep Gnome and the Dwergar. The, uh, the Dwergar are the Underdark races of dwarves. So some of the races uh, live in the Underdark. Uh, the Underdark, uh, let's see, are the Drow in here? No, the Drow are actually in the Player's Handbook. Okay, and then the Drow are the Dark Elves. Uh, some of the humanoid races got trapped in the Underdark, a, a wide span of tunnels beneath the Earth, um, on Toril in, in specific, uh, a, a planet within the realms of D&D. Um, so these are people that got trapped in the Underdark and have been um, kind of changed by the Underdark itself. So you get a lot of dark vision um, as well as some psychic abilities because there's a lot of mind flayers in the Underdark and stuff like that. So you get some psionic fortitude for the Dwergar. Um, you have some, uh, I cannot pronounce this word, but I'm going to try, Svitlnevlin camouflage. Um, the, uh, deep gnomes are also called the Svitlnevlin, or whatever you pronounce that. Um, that's a really bad pronunciation, but you know what I mean. Uh, so yeah, those are kind of the Underdark races. And then you have your Feywild races. Um, so centaurs and bugbears and goblins are the, your Feywild races, as well as Herengon uh, and stuff like that, uh, and satyrs. So these are all your Feywild people. Um, your Feywild races are typically going to have some teleportation skills um, to kind of jump through the Feywild and, uh, you know, are, are roughly fairy-ish. Your fairies are also Feywild uh, traits as well, Feywild races as well. So you get these fey ancestries and a lot of things. Uh, for centaurs, you're gonna have hooves, so you get like this equine build and your hooves and stuff like that, and you can charge. Bugbears are, are uh, a type of goblin, uh, they're a goblinoid. Um, neither bug nor bear, but very hairy. Um, they're all about sneak attacking, they have very long limbs. Um, they're just sn very big yet very sneaky. Um, Fairies obviously have flight and a little bit of in, uh, innate magic, as well as that fey ancestry. Um, goblins have uh, are very small. Uh, they can do nimble escapes. They can do fury of the small, where they just do more damage on attacks against creatures that are larger than them. Uh, Herengons are your classic uh, rabbit folk. Um, so just like the the uh, March Hare, um, you have your rabbit legs. Um, you can hop quite uh, hop quite far dif distance. You get some advantages on dexterity saving throws, stuff like that. Hobgoblins are also a type of goblin. Um, they're a bit larger than normal goblins, uh, and uh, they're all about kind of bringing together these societies and, and fighting in uh, groups. Um, so you get your fortune from the menis, you get your normal fey ancestry, stuff like that. Um, fey ancestry, by the way, is like being hard to be put to sleep, uh, and um, uh, you have resistances on some charms, stuff like that. Satyrs are kind of similar. Um, they're your horned folk. They have these mirthful leaps because their bottom half is, uh, what is it, deer or goat-like? Something like that. Um, and then, of course, you have your mirthful revelers and magic resistance and stuff like that. So yeah, those are kind of the Feywild races. Um, there's also a lot of elves in here. Uh, there's the Eladrin, um, as well as the, I think, sea elves are in here. Yes, and Shatterkai. So let's talk about the elves. Um, so elves are previously kind of fey creatures that have turned into um, material creatures only because they've been kind of shut out from the fey wild when... Uh, Lolf, the spider goddess, uh, kind of collapsed the Seldarin, the uh, elven gods. Um, so they were kind of kicked out of the Feywild, and, and, and uh, there was this diaspora kind of across the realms where these Fey creatures eventually turned into the elves. 
determining on their determined on their surroundings are their kind of physical adaptations um, because they're still kind of uh, mercurial just like their fey ancestors um, so you have some eladrin um, eladrins are the most close to their previous kind of elven forms and eladrins actually change their kind of appearance and some of their abilities based on the season so when you're an eladrin you get to choose kind of at a long rest um, whether you're a spring summer uh, fall or winter eladrin and you get a teleportation uh, where you kind of step through the feywild a short distance um, and what happens after that is going to be uh, based on what season you are. So Eladrin are really cool. They're kind of uh, the most close to these base uh, fey races. You have your fairies, but but those aren't kind of the fey spirits that the, the elves were originated from. Um, so uh, you also have your sea elves down here, um, which are elves that kind of landed in the oceans. Um, and sea elves can breathe in water automatically. Um, you can talk to uh, creatures with swimming speeds um, and then uh, and stuff like that. You can swim in water very well. Um, and then you have the Shatter Kai, which are elves that... Uh, were flung to the Shadowfell in their diaspora. The Shadowfell is like a negative reflection of the material plane, so you have a lot of grim energy in you. Um, you have some blessings from the Raven Queen, who rules the Feywild, um, as well as ne uh, you know resistance to necrotic damage in the classic Elf Trance. Elves don't need to sleep, they, they just kind of meditate for a while and they're fine. Um, Tritons are pretty similar to Sea Elves, um, but they have their own kind of thing. Tritons are pretty similar to mermaids as well. So if you want to play a mermaid or a merman, Triton is probably your way to go. You can control a little bit of water, um, and these uh, Tritons kind of developed underwater on their own, uh, unlike water genasi or sea elves. All right, so let's go through the other races really quick. Um, changelings uh, can change their bodies and their faces to look like someone else, um, and they originally come from Eberron. Uh, I think I covered all of these, all of these. Furbolgs are kind of like half giants. Um, they are nature folk. Uh, they're, they're kind of like, uh, I don't know why, but the D&D community tends to think of them as cow-ish. They're kind of similar to cows for some reason. Um, but yeah, they can talk to plants and animals um, innately. Uh, they're very large, stuff like that. I uh, already covered Fire Genasi a bit. Um, Gith Yankee and Gith Zerai are both types of Gith. Um, Gith are people that have been flung to the astral plane for a long time. The astral plane is this plane of kind of thought and um, uh, where time doesn't pass. Uh, gods that have stopped being worshipped are there. Um, so the Gith Yankee are more about uh, kind of brute strength, um, while the Gith Zerai are more about kind of mental strength. Um, both have a little bit of psionics. Um, the Gith Yankee turn their psionics towards resilience, while the Gith Sarai turns their psionics towards kind of um, mental discipline, right? Uh, so Gith Zarai and Gith Yankee are both very cool uh, kind of monk races. Gith Zarai were also uh, flung to limbo and have meditated in the chaos, kind of at the center of the chaos for a long time. Um, they were also, both both types of Gith, were um, entrapped by the Mind Flayers for a long time and given a little bit of their psychic energy in order to look over kind of the uh, underlings one, row, run, one rung below them. But they eventually escaped and now live in the astral plane. Uh, occasionally coming to the material plane to grow uh, because you don't grow in the astral plane because no time passes. So Goliaths are also a kind of half giant, um, but more about the mountain. Uh, so these are your foresty half giants, and these are your mountain half giants. Um, you get stones and dorans. You get uh, it's hard to make a giant cold from the mountains um, and stuff like that. Uh, you have Kenkus, uh, Kobolds, and Lizard Folk. Kobolds and Lizard Folk are kind of similar. They're both the uh, kind of reptilian creatures. Um, kobolds are all about dragons, um, and you get this intimidating draconic cry, while Lizard Folk are, are, are just lizards kind of from the jungle, right? Um, you can bite and eat stuff, and this is one of the most not monstrous races, right? Because you're literally eating your enemies with hungry jaws and stuff like that. Kenku are really interesting. 
I like Kenku, especially this rewritten Kenku. Kenku are a cursed bird folk, so they're kind of raven folk. They don't have wings, um, like most kobolds, they don't have wings, um, and they're mostly from the Shadowfell. Um, they're really good at duplicating stuff. In the past, Kenku were only able to speak what they had heard. Um, but now Kenku have voices of their own, but they're just really good at mimicking stuff like Raven. So if you want to play kind of a Raven folk, Kenku are for you. Um, Minotaur and Orcs are strong folk. Um, Orcs are people uh, blessed by Grumish, uh, a god of war. Um, so uh, Grum uh, Orcs that you play are typically not dedicated to Grumish because Grumish is all about, you know, destroying stuff. Um, but you do get the adrenaline rush of, uh, you know, Orcs. You get some endurance. You get powerful builds. Um, so Orcs are good for kind of barbarian classes and stuff like that. Minotaurs are pretty similar, um, but uh, they they have their classic horns. Um, you get your hammering horns and your goring rush, all about that stuff. You also get some labyrinthine recall uh, in case you ever need to guard a maze of sorts. Already covered all of these. Uh, tabaxi are cat folks. They get cat claws. They get feline agility. They can run really, really fast. Turtles are uh, turtles are turtle folks. Um, so if you want to play a ninja turtle, here's your here's your race. You can hold your breath very well. You get some serious defenses with your shell, uh, watching your back, um, which watch is also kind of nature's uh, natural armor. You can hold your breath very well, and you also have some intuition about the nature around you, being kind of a wise old turtle. Um, and then you have your shifters, which are kind of your uh, half werewolves almost. Um, you can shift into uh, forms that are uh, somewhat bestial, but also somewhat humanoid. Um, and there are different kinds of shifters. So you can be uh, kind of a wolf-like shifter, you can be a cat-like shifter, all of and, and some more stuff in there. Yuan T are snake folk. Um, Yuan T uh, came into existence when the humans uh, when humans began to worship snake gods and uh, kind of turned into the Yuan T through foul rituals and bloodletting and and sacrifice and all that fun stuff. Um, so I, I say that sarcastically. Um, the Yuanti here is a Yuanti pure blood, which is a humanoid um, that doesn't have a snake tail or snakes for arms or a snake head or anything like that. Though many Yuanti do uh, have most of their body replaced by snakes. Um, and Yuanti can consider themselves many Yuanti uh, that still worship the snake uh, goddesses um, and, and the snake gods. Uh, typically consider themselves the kind of pinnacle of serpentine evolution. Um, you get some magic and uh, poison resistance, as well as some innate spell casting uh, from the kind of blood of the serpent gods. Um, Yuanti are creepy. Uh, so if you want to play a warlock, uh, Yuanti are for you. Um, and then quickly, you have your sci-fi races down here. You have your astral elves, uh, which are, you know, pretty self-explanatory, kind of like Spock. You have your auto gnomes, which are uh, constructs built by gnomes to resemble them. You have your gif, which are your firearm, uh, hippo, broad shoulder, you know, uh, creatures. Uh, you have your hadozis, which are your monkey folks that can glide through the air. You have your plasmoids, which are just kind of oozy creatures um, that can extrude some pseudopods. And then you have your three cream, which are four-armed uh, insect folk. Um, so yeah, those are the races. Choose your race. Uh, again, if you're new, stick to the player's handbook. Stick to what you know. You know what a dwarf is. Everyone knows what an elf is. Uh, everyone knows what a human is, hopefully. Um, and then last but not least, you want to choose your background. Now... There are a lot of backgrounds. You can also create your own background, um, which is totally fine. Your background gives you uh, a few skill proficiencies, a few language or tool proficiencies, and a little bit of starting equipment. This is where you get most of your starting equipment from. You also get some starting equipment from your race. Um, so you choose your background. It also gives you kind of a feature and some characteristics. So this is where you get a lot of your kind of role play inspiration um, that can lead into uh, creating a well-rounded character. So your background is mostly for role play. I like to stick to these sources here. Um, other sources can become too specific, uh, but players tend to like this uh, 
players tend to like this collection, and I run most of my games in the Sword Coast and Ravenloft anyway. I think the majority of D&D games are probably in the Sword Coast or Ravenloft. Um, so this is a good kind of layout of backgrounds. So yeah, choose your background and you're pretty much done. Um, you can go watch if you want to, you know, put all of this together. You're just writing stuff down as you go. Um, I also did some uh, information on how to choose your ability scores in how to use D&D Beyond for players, my how to use D&D Beyond for players book, um, my uh, video, sorry, not book. Um, but if you want to know how to generate your ability scores really quick, um, you can use point by, which is a system of using 27 points to allot your ability scores. Um, point by is, uh, on Dean to beyond. And also I believe somewhere in the player's handbook here, um, Determine ability scores. Here it is. Yeah, so point buy is over here. So you get 27 points to start out, um, and then you can choose, uh, you can spend some of these points with the cost column to make an ability score. So you can spend seven points out of that 27 to do a 14, and then you got 20 points left to uh, assign your other uh, five ability scores to. You can also roll for stats. Um, when you roll for stats, you are going to roll uh, four D6s, and then you're going to drop the lowest and you can put that ability score wherever you want. Um, so let's let's do an example. Uh, so let's roll four D6s right here. Uh, oh, that's really bad. Uh, okay, so six, two, and two, that's gonna be 10. So one of our ability scores is 10. We can just kind of set that 10 aside and let it simmer and then roll the others. Uh, and then once you're done rolling, you can uh, assign those ability scores wherever you want. Um, so here's a little bit of a better one. So four, four, and two, uh, discard the one. So that's going to be another 10. Um, so you, you have that, uh, and then let's do one more, just for example, uh, four D six, keep the highest three. Oh, awful stats. Okay. Three, four, five, and, uh, six, seven. So we're going to have a seven in one of our ability scores. Um, don't be afraid of those negatives. Um, so yeah, once you write all those down, you assign those in whatever order you want to your ability scores. Um, and that's how you determine those. Once you determine your ability scores, you're also going to have a proficiency bonus. Your proficiency bonus just goes up by level. Um, all of your uh, class tables have their proficiency bonus in them, uh, but it's going to be the same for every character. It's plus two up to level four, plus three up to level eight, uh, sorry, plus three up to level eight, uh, plus four up to level 12, plus five up to level 16, and then plus six for 17 through 20. Um, your proficiency bonus is pretty much added to everything you're proficient with. Um, you're also going to get some proficiencies from your class. So from Paladin, I got all the armor proficiencies and all the weapon proficiencies, uh, some dice proficiencies and, ba and uh, languages from my background and race. So here's how you determine what your bonuses are on your character sheet. Um, first, you're going to determine if you're proficient with something. For armor... Probably stay away from armor you're not proficient with. If you're not proficient with armor and you're wearing it, you're going to have a lot of penalties and you're going to just kind of have a bad time. Um, you're not going to be able to cast spells um, along, with some, and along with some other stuff. So try to just stay away from, from you know, armor you're not proficient with. Uh, so just wear armor you're proficient with unless you were doing something really weird. Um, so for attacks, let's do attack rolls first. If you're proficient with the weapon, you're going to add your proficiency bonus to the attack roll. And then you're going to add your strength bonus if it's a melee weapon. Um, and you're going to add your dexterity uh, or you're going to add your dexterity bonus if it's a ranged weapon or finesse weapon. With a finesse weapon, you can actually choose between sh strength or dexterity. And a weapon will just have, the, have this finesse tab um, when you look on the weapons table. So let's take some examples. Uh, let's take a javelin. Uh, let's take a, uh, well, what do I have on my character sheet? Let's take a war hammer, for example. So a war hammer, am I proficient? Let's see. Let's find the war hammer. So the war hammer is down here in the martial weapons. It's also a martial melee weapon. So am I proficient? Yep, I'm proficient in all martial weapons. So I'm going to add that plus four to the attack roll because my proficiency bonus is plus four right now. 
All right, since it's a melee weapon, we're gonna add my strength modifier. Okay, four plus four is eight, pretty straightforward. Let's do the same thing for Javelin. All right, Javelin is a simple melee weapon. Am I proficient? Yep, I, I'm proficient in all simple weapons. Uh, and it's also a melee weapon, so I'm gonna add my strength modifier. Four plus four is eight again, fantastic. Now, a Javelin has the throne property. Uh, but it's not a ranged weapon. It's not in this category down here. That's just these crossbows and stuff uh, and these weapons down here. Um, so if it's a weapon is thrown, you can just throw it. You use the same modifier. Um, so, so let's do this again for another weapon. So let's say I'm wielding a short sword. Uh, so short swords are down here. They're martial melee weapons. Um, so I'm proficient with them and they're melee. So you would normally use strength, but they have the finesse property. For a finesse property, you can choose whether to use strength or dexterity. So if my dexterity is higher, I would have used dexterity, but for now, I'll just use plus four if I were to use a short sword, if Lyle Verdant were to use a short sword. Um, but if you're a ranger and you have a high dexterity, um, for example, you might be using a, let's just say I have an, uh, these strength scores are, these scores are swapped. So I have an 18 dexterity. Uh, if you're a ranger, that's a pretty, uh, standard dexterity. So let's say you're using your longbow, um, since it's a martial ranged weapon, uh, you would be proficient with it. And it's, since it's ranged, you would use your dexterity modifier. And then again, for finesse, you choose either strength or dexterity. Uh, all right. So that's how you do attack rolls. Saving throws are pretty similar. Um, you add your bonus from your uh, from your ability score, and then you add your proficiency bonus if you're proficient. So for in, uh, intelligence here, I have a minus one, but I have a plus four from one of my abilities, one of my uh, features. Don't worry about that too much. Um, so just pretend like all of these are like minus four. Uh, for but for wisdom, for example, I have a plus four from this feature. I have a plus one from the uh, ability modifier, and then I have a plus four from the proficiency bonus. So that totals up to plus nine, which is really good. Um, so yeah, just add your ability score, add your proficiency bonus, and then any other kind of features that might be there. Uh, same thing for skill checks. So you add the proficiency bonus if you're proficient and you add the relevant score. So for athletics, the relevant score is strength. So that's going to be a plus four. And since I'm proficient, that's going to be another plus four for another plus eight. For history, I have a minus one in intelligence, but I'm proficient. So I have a plus four. Four minus one is plus three and on and on down the line. Uh, so yeah, those are how you calculate the three main scores. Uh, but Adam, how do I tell what my uh, ability modifier is? Well, you take your ability score, you m subtract 10, you half it, and then you round down. So for strength, subtract 10 is uh, 18 minus 10 is 8, half that down to 4, no need to round down. Dexterity, it's just a 10, flat 0. Uh, 13, subtract 10 for a 3, half that down to a 1.5, round down to a 1. Intelligence, subtract 10 for negative two, half that down for minus one, no need to round. Same thing for wisdom, 12 minus 10 is two, half that down to one, no need to round down. And then charisma is the same as strength. So let's say you had a 15 for your ability score, 15 minus 10 would be five, uh, divided by two is 2.5, round that down to two, 15 would give you a plus two. There's also a table in the player's handbook, but you don't need a table, you can do math. Um, so yeah, that's how you uh, uh, decide all of that. Your uh, class will also give you some inventory to start with. Um, uh, you'll have some uh, weapons to equip. Uh, you might have a shield. Shields just give you plus two if you're wielding them. You need an empty hand to wield a shield. And then your class will, uh, you'll, uh, will also give you some armor to start with. Uh, your armor will have a set kind of AC, um, and then you might have some bonuses to that too. Uh, so for me, I have uh, a 16 AC from just wearing chainmail. I have a plus one for my fighting style and I have a plus two for my shield for 19 AC. Uh, some armor 
has uh, certain bonuses. So if you're wearing light armor, you can always add your dexterity modifier. If you're wearing medium armor, you can add your dexterity modifier to a maximum of plus two. So the max you can get for hide armor is 14, for example. The max you can get for half plate is 17. And then for your heavy armor, it's just set. Your AC just is what it is. Um, and then you can still get bonuses from shields and stuff. Some heavy armor also has strength uh, requirements. Um, and some armor has uh, gives you disadvantage on stealth because it's noisy. So yeah, that's how AC works. Um, your walking speed is usually determined by your race. It's usually around 30. Uh, last but not least, let's talk a little bit about spells um, uh, and passive scores. So your passive score is going to be 10 plus whatever your modifier is. So your passive perception, which is really the only passive score that matters very much, um, is going to be 10 plus your perception bonus. So minus 10 plus 1 for 11. <coughs> okay. Now we can really get to spells. So if you're playing a full caster, you're going to have spells at level 1. If you're playing a half caster or a full marshal, you won't have too many spells. Some races also give you kind of innate spells. You're going to manage spells on d and Beyond or your spell sheet if you're on uh, playing on paper. Um, so your cantrips are your spells that you can cast as much as you want and you don't pay anything to cast your cantrips. So you just cast them and you're done. While you're casting them, or any spell, you're going to see that all spells have a time associated with them. This is their casting time. So you need to spend an action to cast most spells. Some spells are bonus actions. When you cast a spell as a bonus action, something special happens. Um, keep in mind on your turn, uh, once you're in combat, you're going to have your action, your bonus action, your movement speed, and your interaction. Your movement speed is self-explanatory. You can choose to use it or not. It's 30 feet for me and for most people. You just move across the board, whatever board you're using, whatever 30 feet is on that board, whatever the scale is. Then you have your action, which is the main thing you do per turn. Some characters have bonus actions for two-weapon fighting or for quick spells or anything like that. Uh, don't feel bad if you're not using your bonus action. Some classes don't have a whole lot of bonus actions. Um, and then you have your interaction, which is stuff like drawing weapons or pushing a door open, just a small way you interact with your environment that you don't want to eat up your whole turn. So yeah, let's get back to spells um, and casting times and stuff. So when you cast a spell with a casting time of an action, nothing particular special happens. When you cast a spell with a casting time of a bonus action, um, you can't cast another spell during the turn except for casting a cantrip with a casting time of one action. A lot of DMs say this as you can't cast more than one spell of first level or higher on your turn. That's true most of the time. Just keep in mind, this is the actual rule. When you cast a spell with a casting time of a bonus action, you can't cast another spell during the same turn, except for a cantrip with a casting time of an action. Weird stuff can happen here with action surge. Don't worry about it too much. What you kind of need to know with casting spells is casting a spell takes a little bit longer than kind of your normal action. Um, this is reflected in the initiative score variance in the DMG, in the slow spell where sometimes you can't cast a spell if you, uh, um, if you roll low on a d20. So if you're slowed, you can take your normal action, uh, but if you're casting a, ca a spell with a casting time of an action, half of the time you have to use two turns. So casting a spell takes a little bit longer and it's reflected in the game in, in, in a couple weird ways. Um, when you cast a spell, you also have to use some components. Uh, there's V, S, and M for verbal, somatic, and material. Verbal components are something you say or a noise you make, so keep in mind you're making noise when casting spells. Somatic is some gesture you make, so you're waving your hands around in some way. And then material is a uh, particular thing you need. Um, so the parentheses will tell you after the M will tell you what material you need. If this uh, material is does not have a cost associated and is not consumed, you don't actually need it. You can use a spell casting focus instead. So for armor of Agathis, you need a cup of water. You can cast this with a normal cup of water, but if you have a spell casting focus, like a wand that you use multiple times, or an orb, or a crystal, or a holy symbol, you can just hold your holy symbol while casting that, and it will replace the material component. 
For protection from evil and good, you need holy water or powdered silver and iron, which the spell consumes. So since it's consumed, you actually need the, the listed material. Um, uh, some other spells like Revivify also have listed materials with costs. So uh, you need diamonds worth 300 gold pieces, which the spell consumes. But yeah, other than that, casting spells is just like any other action you take. You tell your DM you want to do it. Um, it might ha It's going to have some effect. So um, some spells require your enemy to make a saving throw against your spell save DC. So your spell modifier is going to be based off of your spell casting modifier. In this case, it's charisma, so I have a plus four. Your spell attack is going to be your, uh, your spell modifier plus your proficiency bonus. And then your spell save DC is going to be 8 plus your spell casting, modif uh, plus your spell casting attack modifier. Uh, it's always going to be 8 plus stuff. I've, I know my character sheet has a lot of 8s on it. Uh, it's 8 for everyone. So it's just 8 plus your spell attack modifier. Even if my spell attack modifier was plus 7, it would be 15 because it would be 8 plus 7. So yeah, that's how spell saves work. Uh, remember, they need to meet or exceed your spell save DC to succeed. So if someone rolls an 18, they're going to succeed against the spell save DC of command, and pretty much nothing will happen. Um, in general, if someone succeeds on a damaging spell, uh, they'll typically take half of the damage for most spells. If they, uh, some spells, it's either they succeed and nothing happens, or uh, some stuff happens. Um, the spell won't tell you that nothing happens, it will just say, hey, here's what happens on a failure. So for hold person, uh, the target must succeed on a wisdom saving throw or be paralyzed for the duration. If they don't succeed on the uh yeah, they must succeed on the wisdom saving throw or be paralyzed. So if they succeed, nothing happens. If they fail, that's when they're paralyzed. So just be aware of that little nothing happens clause that's kind of hidden in there. Each time you cast a spell with a spell level, say first level or higher, um, it's going to consume a spell slot. So if you cast a first level spell, it consumes a first level spell slot. If you cast a second level spell, second level, and on and on. You can also upcast. So if you don't have a second level spell slot available for spiritual weapon, let's say I have all three of mine, uh, you can see that I can't cast them at second level anymore. But what I can do is I can sh uh, tick off one of my third level spell slots and cast spiritual weapon with that third level slot. You can't go down. You need a spell slot of that level, that spell level or higher to cast it. Um, but you can always use your higher level spell slots. Um, some, some stuff happens when you upcast like this. It's called upcasting. So when you cast a spell using a spell slot of third level or higher, the damage increases by 1d8 for every two slots, uh, every two spell slot levels above second. So I need, I would need to spell, uh, cast this spell with a fourth level spell slot or higher for something to really happen, but the option is always there for you. Uh, everyone regains their spell slots on a long rest. Uh, some classes regain some spell slots on a short rest. Just read your class features. Um, and these are the last two kind of uh, things that you really need to know about, besides kind of tracking your hit points. Uh, obviously, when you take damage, if you take five points of damage, you'll track your hit points like that. If you have any resistances, that's going to half your damage. So say I was resistant to fire damage for some reason, and I took 10 points of fire damage. I'd only subtract five hit points because that damage is halved. Uh, and it's rounded down. So same thing would happen if I took 11 points of fire damage. I just uh, decrease my health by five. 11 divided by 2 is 5.5, rounded down is 5. Um, temporary hit points come off first, um, and you don't really need to know too much about temporary hit points. Um, and then we have our rests. Your long rest is basically a full reset. You regain all your hit points, all your spell slots, and half of your hit dice. So you have a number of hit dice equal to your character level, and they're determined by your class. In this case, since I'm a paladin, paladin's uh, hit dice are d10s, so I just have 10 d10. You use your hit dice during short rests, and some game features occasionally pull from your hit dice. Um, but when you take a short rest, some stuff happens, just based on your features, but you can always use your hit dice, and then some classes get some extra stuff that they can refresh. So say I'm at, say, 30 health right now, and I want to take a short rest. Um, when you take a short rest, you can kind of mend your wounds and use some... Uh, uh, use some natural healing. So let's say I wanted to use three of my hit dice. I would roll a d10 for each one I use and then add my constitution modifier to each one. 
So spending one hit dice is 1d10 plus one. And then I can do that any number of times at a short rest that I want. Once I hit take short rest, uh, it'll confirm that. Um, but uh, you can also roll your hit dice on Dean Beyond like this. You would also do this at a table. Hey, that's a pretty good roll. So 10 plus two plus my constitution modifier twice, I would regain 16 hit points. You can see Dean to Beyond put that in automatically. Um, so I was at 30, now I'm at 46, and then I can hit take short rest. Let's say I use some more hit dice, do some more healing, um, stuff like that. So 12, so that's 58, okay, cool. Once I take a long rest, only half of my hit dice are restored. Um, so you still have some kind of, you're still a little beat up from your long rest um, if you've spent more than half of your hit dice. So be a little careful with how you spend your hit dice. Um, other than that, I think that's pretty much everything. If you want to see how to put things together on D&D Beyond, again, I have a video for how to use D&D Beyond as a player, um, but that's pretty much everything for how to play D&D. Um, just keep in mind the three main roles of D&D, your saving throws, your skill checks, and your attack rolls. Roll your d20, if you hit, you roll your damage, or do what the spell tells you, um, or the DM might tell you that the, some effect is lessened or something like that. Um, so yeah, now you know how to play D&D. &D. Um, that's all the kind of mechanic stuff, but don't forget to roleplay um, between kind of uh, mechanical encounters. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you guys learned how to play D&D, &D, learned kind of where your modifiers and AC and HP are coming from a little bit more deeply. Um, and I, now that I mentioned it, I have to go over HP. I was trying to do the outro, but let's do the HP really quick. Okay, your hit points are determined by your uh, class as well as your constitution modifier. So for paladins, I have a d10. At first level, you just get that full 10 as if you roll the highest number possible on your hit dice, plus your constitution modifier for one equals 11. So I have 11 hit points for first level. For the next nine levels, at levels higher than your first, um, or when you multi-class and take the first level of a class after you've already had a first level character, you take half of the hit dice rounded up, one of the rare times when you round up in D&D, &D. any other time you round down, unless it specifically says so. So for those other nine levels, I have a six, because D10 rounded down is 5.5 for an average, um, and then you round up for six. Well, you take the average of the die and round up, you don't just half it. Um, or you can just half it and add one. That's probably easier to remember. So for a D6, it's four. For a D8, it's uh, five. For a D10, it's six. And for a D12, it's seven. So it just goes right up like that. But in any case, um, my other nine levels are all going to have my constitution modifier added. And if my constitution goes up, it, it replies retroactively, by the way. Um, and then they're gonna have that six from my hit dice. So the six from the hit dice plus one from the constitution is gonna be seven. So I'm gonna gain seven health for the other nine levels. Uh, nine times seven. Oh man, this is a hard one. Uh, <laughs> what is nine times seven? Is that 63? Yeah, it's 63. Um, and then we'd add the 10 plus one for 11. So 63 plus 11 is 74, which is my current max hit points. So that's how you calculate your hit points. D&D Beyond will also do it automatically for you, just by the way. Um, and you can also roll for it. So at those higher levels, instead of just taking the six, you can roll a D10. So you might roll a, uh, let's, let's do that. So let's say I'm determining my hit points for, um, uh, let's say I take another level in Paladin. I'm now a level 11 Paladin. Let's determine my hit points. So I'd roll a D10, I'd get a four, uh, plus one would be five. So my hit points would now be 79. If I just took the average, they'd be 81 because I'd add uh, six plus one is uh, seven. So I'd add seven to 74. So that'd be 81. All right, now you know pretty much everything about how to play D&D. &D. Um, uh, you'll run into conditions. You'll run into, other, you'll have to read your spells. You'll have to read some features that you get from your class feature. But you know the basic idea of where these numbers are coming from, um, how to determine them, how to roll your dice and apply them, and you know those three main roles of D&D, which is most of what you have to remember. Your saving throws, your skill checks, and your attack rolls. So now, with this knowledge that you have been given, you can go forth to adventure, have a lot of fun in those dungeons, remember to slay the dragons, have fun, everyone, and I will see you guys at the proverbial table. Thanks for watching.